to the podcast Appetite for Horror, episode 15, uh, author of Exorcist Legacy, 50 Years of Fear. I hate to maybe make a, you know, to date you, I guess, but I'm going to be 40 later this year. So you got 10 years of legacy. So I got some much, I have a little bit to catch up on. <laughs> You're a kid. <laughs> You're yeah. a kid. I appreciate you saying that. I just had one. And by the way, oh. if he starts crying in the background, I apologize. But well, I'll, okay, I'll I'll accept your kid and I'll raise you one dog who is mine wandering around the background. We'll have oh. our, our our second best in with us here. Oh, I love it. <laughs> and I bring that up too because I was actually reading his your book rather, Fifty Years of Fear, to him. So, like one of his first books I've ever read to him is is yours. So uh, I don't know if it's appropriate for a three month old. But I was reading your book to my son. As long as the head didn't spin around, you're okay. <laughs> he's, <laughs> I think he's okay. The head's a little floppy, but not spinning around still. Well, you know, it'll it'll give us give him something to work out into therapy in a couple of years. Yes, it is. Yes, it will. Absolutely. Uh, what I found most fascinating, and something that I grew up on with, you know, The Exorcist already being an established horror movie, was that it was not meant to be a horror movie it was not meant to be scary in that way so can you kind of explain because that seemed to be one of the major points of your book is that this was not meant to be the quote scariest movie of all time it turned out to be that but that wasn't certainly the thing that director william friedkin and writer william peter blatty wanted bill blatty when he wrote his book which was published in 1971 wanted to write a book and this is reflective, I think, of his Jesuit education and his strong belief in Catholicism, that he said if he could prove the existence of a personified devil, then perhaps it would also be proof of a real God and a life everlasting. And that is what fueled him through not only The Exorcist, but its sequel, Legion, and another book that he had written called The Ninth Configuration. It's, it's Blatty's trilogy of faith, where he was trying to argue for the existence of Satan as proof of the existence of God. Now, to right. logicians like myself, this means if you establish apples, that doesn't necessarily prove there are oranges. Right. But for Blatty, it became a viable force. And that's the integrity of the film, which both he and Billy Friedkin referred to as not a horror film, but as a supernatural detective story. Because there's four things going on. And interrupt me if I'm taking up too no, much sound bites. No, please. That's what I'm here for, to hear you talk. There are four things going on in The Exorcist. One, it's a detective story. Who killed Burke Dennings, the obnoxious director? Secondly, it's a story about a priest, Father Karras, who's lost his faith and gets his faith restored with the greatest thing a human can do. He sacrifices his life to save the life of someone else. It's also the story about Father Marin, Lancaster Marin, the priest who once encountered the demon and is now encountering an old enemy. But at its core, and what I think makes it most relatable, it's the story of a mother going to any length she has to to save her daughter. That is, of course, encouraged by the incredible performance of Ellen Burstyn, who I believe is the best actress of her generation in America, if not everywhere, uh, who understood that it's a story about survival and a mother's perseverance. And every one of those stories is a personal contact that the audience can have. It's not about vomit. It's not mm -hmm. about a turning head. It's about real people in crisis. Yeah, I agree. And and somebody because I, I believe that you said that you were the same way because I'm even though I was raised Jewish, I consider myself agnostic. So when I lean towards horror movies, I'm not the biggest fan of Supernatural because I just don't believe in it. Like, it's hard for me to suspend disbelief. But The Exorcist helps you like it really does just the way that it was done back then. It helps you suspend that disbelief. Absolutely. So, you yeah. saw a, a mate like a big difference in whether it was a religious moviegoer versus just the average moviegoer wanting to see the shock and the awe of it. Is is that how you what you took away from it? it, it I guess it depended upon the views of the audience, uh, religious views. No? I, I think so. Of course, I I gave her religion for Lent, you know, so it's it's hard for me to describe <laughs> right. that, but. Uh, I think the more devout people were, the more they believed in the tenets of the film, perhaps the more effective they were. You know, the Catholic Church didn't have a problem with the film because it was essentially a commercial for them. I think other faiths sure. may have had a problem because they couldn't relate to it as dogmatically as, as the Catholics did. But it is, to me, it's a very religious film, certainly more than Cecil B. DeMille's, you know, orgies. 
uh, it, and it works in very personal ways, which is what true religion should do. It doesn't have to demonstrate anything. As, as somebody said, you know, you don't have to have demons flying out of her mouth mm. to say that it's a religious film. It's a movie that is about the mystery of faith. How contra? I mean, obviously, it's still controversial now, but at that time, to get it made, because I'm, it's so. When you look at now, 2023, there's controversial films all the time. The only movie in my, and this was a recent one that I can even think of that had the same visceral effect that you read about in, you know, whether it's newspapers and now online magazines, was uh, Terrifier Two. There were reports of people throwing up in theaters, but I think that was from the over-the-top gore. But back then, to have a movie create that visceral reaction, I guess I'm kind of surprised that it was so popular and received all those, those accolades. Because you usually don't, even though it's not technically a, a horror, as we've discussed, you usually don't see those kind of movies appreciated by the masses or by the Academy because it's not a drama. It's not a, mm. maybe even a comedy. It's It's something... A little bit more evil or disgusting. So, it, was it hard to get that movie made? I guess to begin with, it was, was hard it... in the sense that Bill Blatty said his script was turned down by seventeen different studios, and in fact, it was producer Paul Monash who is best known for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and the Friends of Eddie Coyle and for creating television's Peyton Place, who was able to option the book. And then some finagling that involved Warner Brothers and Blatty. Eventually, he lost control of it uh, for the good. Um, in fact, I have, I think his only interview about it in the book, because I used to know Paul, um, everybody turned it down because they didn't want to make it not, not about the religion. They just didn't understand what it was. And it wasn't until the book became a bestseller almost mm. by accident that Warner brothers got interested. And the last person they wanted to direct it was William Friedkin. And that's the first person that William Peter Blatty wanted to direct it because he and Friedkin had known each other from an encounter several years before. But then while it was in development, the French Connection opened. And immediately Warner Brothers wanted to be in the William Friedkin business because Billy right. directed the French Connection, which remains one of the greatest policiers ever made. So The Exorcist had a very rough go. And I talk about it throughout The Exorcist legacy about how everybody had their hands in it. And it was only because of Blatty and producer Noel Marshall and William Friedkin that the film kept any purity at all, that they actually kept their eyes on what they wanted to do. And, and this was doing it, you know, out of town where Warner Brothers had no control. And there's a story, which I won't go into it now because it's far too advanced and it's also dirty. Uh, <laughs> when, when Warner Brothers first saw the film, how they reacted to it and what they said to Friedkin after that. So nobody knew they had a hit until they had a hit. Right. Basically right. is it. What about, too, was it a hard to, hard? I think you wrote about it's hard to cast. It was hard to cast. Like they wanted, like, uh, in addition to getting the director that they wanted until the French, French Connection, but Linda Blair was an unknown at that time. Was the, the studio wanted bigger names? Do you, uh, what were some of those bigger names? William Friedkin understood that if you see movie stars in a film like this, you're going to see them as movie stars, not as actors, no matter how good actors they are. Yeah. And so if he and Blatty saw Jason Miller in a a, a play, uh, they they saw um, a, a, a Lee J. Cobb in a play also. Uh, supposedly, uh, Stacey Keach was supposed to play the Father Karras role. They decided not to go with him. Linda Blair and her mother walked into a casting session when they had given up hope of ever finding a young actress. And she turned out to be so together and so smart that it was almost a slam dunk. She took Billy's direction in the casting session with her mother and everybody else there. And then she, of course, was a gift in the film because her intelligence made her performance work. Even though during the possession scene, her voice was replaced by Mercedes McCambridge and a lot of animal noises. It's because she's so likable in the first part of the film that she began to care for her. It was quite a quite an alchemy of getting all these people into one place at one time. Hmm. How much at the time? Because, yeah, everyone talks about the spinning head and the pea soup and throwing up because then practical effects weren't what they were today. So that was pretty special. It's still pretty cool all these years later. But what about the language, the vulgarity of it? Uh what was the audience re like? I guess reaction to that, and in getting a movie where, you know, it's not just f bombs. It's there. There's some language I'm not going to repeat in front of my little baby. I don't want to absurd, you know, of him to absorb that right now. So was, was language ever was there ever a pushback from oh, the studio? Well, no, it was that? an R-rated film, no matter what. Mm -hmm. Of course, the the uh, the television version 
had to be looped a certain amount. In fact, Billy Friedkin himself did some of the looping because Mercedes became it wasn't available for it. And so some of the stuff you hear, like your mother darn socks that smell, or no, actually, it's, <laughs> no, that was that was SNL. Your mother still rots in hell. Yeah, uh, was I think I, I think that's Billy's voice. Uh, the the language was not a concern because they were just liberalizing it. You know, in 1968. Jack Valenti had liberalized the Hollywood production code into the letter rating system. And so the existence of an R rating was keeping kids under 17 without parent or adult supervision out of the theater. And so it was perfectly all right. In the 1970 film MASH, they used the F word for the first time in a major film. So Hollywood had been maturing. And certainly with The Exorcist, they were able to do that. Although in some cities, The Exorcist was treated as an X-rated film because the exhibitors didn't want to run afoul of local censorship people. Okay. Uh, but that's just what the thing was. It became a phenomenon. For you, what were the biggest, I guess, changes from the book to the movie? Like, What did you find, I guess, more intriguing or more, again, I, I hate to say scary and, and horror, but that's just what the, the terminology with the surrounding it. Because that's a lot of movies, you know, adaptations from books to movies and people compare anywhere from Jurassic Park to Harry Potter. And so what about you from from book to to film? What what were some of the I guess the good and what was left out? Perhaps? Well, I have an asterisk next to my experience because I didn't see the film the first time I saw it. Let right. me explain that. I was a publicist for the theater chain in Boston that was showing it and it was supposed to open on December 26th. 1973 but we prevailed upon william freaking to allow a day before screening so that the newspaper critics could make their deadlines and so obviously it was going to be an important film well if you think about your calendar the day before december 26th is christmas morning and if you can imagine hauling the boston critics boston mind you into a theater to see the exorcist tearing them away from the bosom of their family yeah right on christmas morning so it was an experience and I had to guard the door to make sure people who weren't invited didn't get in. So I heard all these sounds going on in the auditorium, but I didn't get to see the movie for a couple of days. And when I finally did see it, having read the book, it didn't scare me as much, although I felt the tension. But the moment that I turned away is also the moment that William Peter Blatty turned away and the moment where most people who ran out of the theater puking turned away. And can you guess what that moment was? I'm assuming it's the pea soup or the head no. turning the head turning wrong on both counts. And eh, eh. the point at which most people ran screaming from the theater was the arteriogram scene when Reagan's in the hospital and she has a needle in her neck and the blood spurts out. OK, and you'll be surprised. And we did an informal poll with the Warner Brothers folks. The people who ran screaming from the theater were men. Very few women ran out. And again, this goes to. The film is about a mother protecting her child. The women in the audience understood the pain of, of watching a child, and they were able to accommodate it. But they're, the men weren't. That, that reminds me of, I guess, speaking of my, of my kid, for whatever reason, like when she was in labor, the nurses said, if I wanted to leave the room when she got the epidural needle, because a lot of husbands faint, I, yeah. I could like you can leave. I'm like, no, I'm fine. I love horror movies. This is I know this is real life, but I'm fine. So I it was I guess I'd never heard that. I thought like during labor, they would try to escort me out of the room. But during the epidural, they like warned me. I'm like, really? I'll, I'll be. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be OK. I think you didn't take videos, did you? No, I did not. I don't understand people <laughs> who do that. <laughs> well, I, yeah. Uh, Dennis Wolfberg, who was a wonderful comedian, talked about being with his wife while she was giving birth when she called him the antichrist for putting her through this. And then he said, yeah, I don't take videos because who are you going to show them to? Right. Like, I'm never going to watch that again. <laughs> uh, but this is obviously a film 50 years later. We want to watch again. So what do you think it is about the exorcist legacy that it's been able to survive so much though? So that there's a new film, it's it's something that's going to be passed down. It's taught. I mean, I know you have. It's taught in colleges because there have been so many films since then that have tried to recreate that phenomenon and has not happened. So what is it about The Exorcist specifically that lives on today? I think it's because something we talked about at the beginning, and that is The Exorcist is not a horror film. It's a film with some horror in it. It's about real people going through extraordinary circumstances. That's something that the people who have made the sequels and the prequels with the exception of Exorcist 3, don't really understand. 
And it's something that I think David Gordon Green, who's making the new films, understands. The trick is, have audiences become jaded? Are they saying if they see something on the screen, oh, it's it's just computer generated? Mm -hmm. You know, the original Exorcist has a veracity because there was no CGI. Everything that happens on the screen actually happened in front of the camera, albeit for mechanical reasons and not because anybody was possessed. But audiences know that there's something ineffable about the veracity of what's going on in The Exorcist, something that the other films simply can't have because they didn't have the budget or the wherewithal or whatever. Thematically, it should work. But when you bring it to the screen, everything has to be perfect. And that's very hard to achieve. That's why I love The Exorcist and older classic thriller harm whatever you want because i'm a practical effects guy it's tangible it's something tangible and it goes also like with the supernatural just with me i'm a tangible kind of person but i can't suspend disbelief for the sake of a plot but it could be a great movie and if there's bad cgi it could just take me right out of it and absolutely never does that I mean, uh, look at look at the howling. Look at an American werewolf in London. It happened. The transformations happened in front of your eyes. Yeah. And they work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there are so many werewolf movies, but that one is is special. Uh, same thing with The Exorcist. It's, it's just uh, it, it's special. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of books written about it. What do you think we'll learn from if this your book that we won't we haven't learned before? Mine is the only book that takes all of the films and puts them in one place and shows how the themes are developed film by film. It also has the uh, advantage, I think, of having stories that were told years ago. You see, I wrote the biography of William Friedkin. It's called Hurricane Billy, and it came out in 1990. And so I got the stories about The Exorcist before people had embellished them, when the film was just a hit, but before Mm. it became a classic. And a lot of people have changed their stories. Over, and I don't blame them. I mean, we are in show business. But I think I go back to the source on many of these things. I also have comments from Tim Lucas, whom you know is the creator with his wife of Video Watchdog, probably the premier chronicle of horror films in this country. And also Mark Kermode, who has called The Exorcist the best film ever made. He's Britain's leading critic, and he has written extensively about it. He was also one of my advisors and participants. So I believe we have a certain believability in the exorcist legacy that puts it above anything else that's been written about it at this time. Maybe more will come out in the future. I don't know. But right now I'm hoping it does well. And I'm hoping people respect the work that we put into it. Well, you definitely put a lot of work into it and it is a great book. I got to finish again, reading it because it's a long book. He he fell asleep when I was reading. No, no offense. He wasn't bored. <laughs> he's just, he's three months. Well, uh, there's also an audio book. You can leave it running while you're in the bathroom ooh, or something. And it's okay. an audio book. Yeah. Right. Let me ask them last <laughs> question. What do you think is the appropriate age for me to show him the exorcist? What do you, when you, when do you think, I mean, I'm not going to be for a few years, but when, when do you, how old do you think he should be to see it? Well, I'm an Ericksonian when it comes to childhood development. So I think you should uh, answer every question a child asks, but only that question. So treat it like a deposition. If he says, Daddy, what is this film about? Then you can tell him it's about a little girl who gets sick and somebody tries to help her. If he gets older and he says, what the hell is this film about? Then perhaps you can be more honest with him. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate Nad Segalov. Thank you so much. And I will just say, reading your bio, now I have Lamb Chops play a uh, sing along and play along <laughs> stuck in my head. Thank uh, you, Brando. Thanks for your thoughts. Because <laughs> <laughs> you've written I'll... many books and then just, uh, just for people who don't know. So uh, check out Nat Segalov's website <laughs> and, of course, the, the new Exorcist uh, book, Legacy, 50 Years Later. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. <laughs> That was a fun interview. Uh, Nat, I heard it once I clicked off, he said, oh, that was fun. So that's what I thought, too. It's always nice when an interviewer uh, feels the same as the interviewee. Doesn't always go that way. But Nat Segaloff, uh, The Exorcist Legacy, 50 Years of Fear is the book. And I don't think I'm going to continue to read that to Horrorson. And more on him in a second. But just want to mention why I mentioned Lamb Chop. And, and so... You go to his website, right, Nat Segaloff, and of course it has the Exorcist book up there, and there's a book about Scarface and mobsters and fire, and then there's like a book about Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop. <laughs> and so yeah, as soon as I saw that, just the song just pops right back into my head. You remember those things from childhood. So that being said, speaking of my three-month-old son, Harrison Rex, Harrison, a couple things there. Interesting. So, if you're, depending upon where you're from, 
or how into true crime you are. I know many of you are, if you're finding a horror podcast. Uh, there has been such, uh, something known as the Gilgo Beach Killers here. On, well, I say here on Long Island. Yeah, I'm in Queens. Sorry. Because I'm so used to being, like, I grew up in the heart of Long Island and Baldwin and Dix Hills. And uh, I, it's a whole other story. Now I'm getting off on a tangent. But, uh, so you just grew up with this, these grisly murders that have never been uh, solved. And so there is a suspect all these years later. There was a film about it in, like, 2013. So, I mean, that's, like, how many years ago we're just talking about just there being a movie about it. And the guy's name is Rex. Okay, so that's my son's middle name. And I named him that because uh, we wanted something short. I love dinosaurs. Um, not always dinosaur horror movies. Have you ever seen the Velocipaster? You heard right. The Velocipasture. Or Pasture. Sorry, I'm Jewish. Am I saying that properly? Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> I, I digress again. And Harrison, after George Harrison. But what I thought and what I always liked... Is how, because I'm a big fan of Dexter, and I finally saw, I guess you can call it the last season or whatever, Dexter New Blood, and I liked it a lot. Not realizing how prominent a character his son, Harrison, would be. Harrison in the first, in the original series, was just a young kid, a baby even. But I love just the the narration of Michael C. Hall is just uh, one of the many reasons why I'm such a huge fan of that show. But Harrison, I don't want to give any spoilers, but, you know, he, he being the son of Dexter, he may or may not have killed or wants to kill whatever. So it's like I give, give it like my son two uh, murderous names. But I've spoken about, and if you do follow on social media, Appetite, the number four horror I posted some pictures of me watching a horror movie while my son's sleeping on my chest. Ha ha, cute, cute. But now, as he's getting older, more aware of sounds, because I would have him on my chest, listening and watching, doing the the Walking Dead binge. And if you missed the, the previous episode that we did, if you're just catching on to this one, I uh, spoke to David Brody about it for a good long while, the whole series and the spinoffs and everything. And uh, he's the one, thank you for giving me the good name of Horror Son. I was like, oh, Horror Harrison. How did, how did Horror Son not come to mind? I'm more, I should be creative uh, enough to have thought of that first, but I didn't. So kudos to you, David Brody. I know you're not listening. So uh, I, I, he's always heard munching of brains, and blah, 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 just like horrible things and gunshots going on. And if anything, I just don't want it to be too loud. But just the other day, just uh, I was feeding him his bottle. And I guess put, I don't even remember. I guess found this super low budget B movie just to watch. I'm like, this looks like uh, schlocky enough. It wasn't exactly a trauma film, but it had that kind of feel to it. And just at the beginning, one of those dumb jump scares happened. Like, you know, a dumb jump scare where, you know, it's not just the, the killer coming out of nowhere. It's a cat. It's a person. It's a friend. Uh, so that's what it was. It was like a friend saying, scaring another friend, hey. But the whole, th- they made it really dramatic. You know, pew, woo. It was like a sound, woo. Just like really, it was loud. Uh, and it's even made me jump a little bit. I wasn't expecting it. It made Harrison jump and he started crying. And I felt like a bad father. <laughs> I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I will never do this again. So I may actually put off watch having a watch horror with me for a while. And putting things on like Lamb Chop. Uh, <laughs> I've been putting on Ninja Turtles for them. And uh, the cartoons that I grew up with. Denver, The Last Dinosaur. Or Rocco's Modern Life. The whole gamut of my childhood. So it might be a bit. Maybe a bit. But. What I do want to mention, if you're jumping on to this Appetite for Horror podcast early on, because I think this is going to be a long-haul podcast. I'm very transparent. If you know anything else that I've done, the Mothership podcast, Appetite for Distortion, uh, if you, for whatever reason, heard me on the radio throughout my career, I'm a very honest person, very transparent. So this is going to be, I would love to do this weekly or something like that, but it's just very difficult when I have a main podcast. I have two actual jobs. I'm now taking care of a three-month-old, and I'm just 
trying not to screw up if I haven't screwed him up already. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, man, I felt so bad. I'm like, huh, let's just keep watching horror movies with you, my young son, who's still forming. And, it, and I hope it just didn't go deep into his subconscious and, like, maybe he will grow up to be a, a serial killer. We'll see what happens. <laughs> see, heads the long haul. But I would, I would love to fact, because I'm always going to have some sort of set up and do recordings and, and watch horror. So as he grows up quickly, then yeah, there'll be times I'm like, okay, here's the first time we're going to watch, I don't know, Teen Wolf. Something baby, the original Teen Wolf with Michael J. Fox, not like the MTV version. But something, the Munsters, Adam's Family, some version of that, any version of that, I think would be safe enough for him. So might have to take steps. But it's not going to be all just baby stuff. Uh, just whatever movies I watch, want to give a review for, and more interviews coming up. So again, if you, well, I should say this. Also, if you have an idea for a guest you would like for me to interview, or perhaps you want to get involved, I could do radio with literally anybody. I, I've done this also throughout my career, just have random co-hosts. I love being able to provide an outlet for those who rarely get to do radio or podcasting. I think it's fun and meet new people to do it this way. So if you have a movie, maybe you want to review with me uh, or a suggestion you want to give me, uh, uh, an interview suggestion, as I mentioned, just let me know. Find me on social media, uh, Appetite for Horror, the number four horror. But I'm sure if you type in Appetite, F-O-R, horror, you'll find things pop up also if you type that into your search engine. Uh, iHeartRadio, uh, Spreaker, Spotify, however you're listening. And of course, you can watch these episodes on the Appetite for Distortion YouTube page. But uh, I'm going to continue to want to do this as well as horror is a part of my life. And I will mention the next episode. It's going to be a short one, but it's going to be a good one. I just know it. Sarah Wayne Callis from The Walking Dead. Lori. So more Walking Dead dead talk so that's gonna be a lot of fun i like her work she has a podcast out that's kind of like a almost like a horror podcast back in the days of radio theater of the mind i think that's super cool to where everyone and their mother has a podcast to do something kind of old school radio with sound effects I, i'm sure they're not using uh, things of tin paper to create lightning we have computers for that now but uh, Aftershock is, is the name of her podcast. And uh, Negan, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, is also on that as well. Different aspect of uh, acting. Can't wait to talk to her about that. So stay tuned for that one. Okay, but when will you see that episode? Well, stick around. Subscribe to us wherever you are listening. And until then, don't die. <laughs>